Good morning and welcome to Second Unitarian Church. I'm John Broom, a member of the church's board of trustees, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. In response to COVID-19, we at 2U are doing our part in slowing the spread of the coronavirus, and we're continuing to meet virtually using Zoom. Now, you'll notice there's a chat feed available to you, uh, and you're welcome to use it to say hello to one another and share your joys and concerns uh, where, when we're at that point in the service. When we would traditionally sing together and read things in unison, you're encouraged to do so as well, even though you are on mute. Our voices echo through the world, so we might just hear one another if we listen closely and sing with our full spirit. As things continue to change, we will be paying close attention to the recommendations of public health officials and respond as quickly as possible. At this time, though, we recognize physical distancing as an act of love and protection. We especially welcome our newcomers this morning. During this time of pandemic, Finding a new community and making new connections can really be challenging. Please know that we're excited to have you, and we look forward to getting to know you. If you're new to us today, you're welcome to note that in our chat. And if you'd like to register your child for RE classes, please reach out to Alicia Obando. Our worship today is led by Virtus Robinson, along with worship coordinator, Christy Anderson, Worship Associate Mary Helen Steiner, Chalice Lighter Daniel. Our music is provided by Carl Kennedy and Jonathan Dunmore. Our tech team members are Megan Dunning, Derek Jackson, John Houck, Epiphany Paris, and Tyler Dustin. I have a couple of announcements for you. If you have a green thumb or perhaps a desire to grow one, to you needs a new head gardener. After several years of truly inspirational service, time has come for Monica Drain to step away and for someone else to step up. If you have some interest, check your order of service for details. Also, we really are working to prepare to reopen the 2U building after its period of rest. If you have suggestions about items we need to consider, as this work continues, please use that suggestion box link in your order of service. Check the rest of the order of service for more announcements, but now I welcome Mary Helen Steinler to lead our call to worship. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a community of children, youth, and adults, a people of many beliefs and traditions, bound not by the specific list of things we believe, but by the values we share. Whether you are joining us for the first time or for the thousandth time, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God some of the time, all of the time, or none of the time, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God, oops, sorry, <laughs> whatever your race, whomever you love, Whichever way you move in the world, however much money is in your pocket, you are welcome here. Now I invite you, as you feel ready, to take a breath in and out. As the music begins, let us enter into our service together. Oh. Uh -huh. 
In just a moment, Daniel will light our chalice, the symbol of our faith. We light our chalice this morning with the words from Mary Sheldon. More than relic, living symbol, beacon to the bewildered, illuminating refuge, love of light of love calling to community, signal of sacred mission. Shine now in the world. Set being ablaze. Kindle our courage. Ignite intuition. Spark our hearts to service. Glow hope. Daniel, would you light our chalice, please? Please join me as we sing our opening hymn, number 317, We Are Not Our Own. Words and music can be found in the order of service, or in the words will be displayed on your screen. Please 
join me in reciting our covenant. The words are on your screen. We covenant to build a community that challenges us to grow and empowers us to honor the truth within ourselves. We will be generous with our gifts and honest in our communication, holding faithful to a love that embraces both diversity and conflict. Called by our living tradition, we will nurture spirituality within a vision of the eternal, living out our inner convictions through struggles for justice and acts of compassion. Please join Don Jonathan Dunmore in singing our congregational hymn, Spirit of Life. My name is Virtus Robinson, and my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm joining you live from Montpelier, Vermont. I invite everyone to join me in watching and listening to this Time for All Ages, a story that I produced that's called When the Children Marched. I especially invite those who are young or young at heart to watch this inspirational story of when the children marched. Hello, my name is Virtus Robinson and I want to tell you a story for all ages. When the children marched. In 1963, in Birmingham, Alamabos, biggest city, many considered it the baddest city as well. From 1957 to 1963, there had been 18 bombings in Birmingham with no arrests. The black children of Birmingham felt oppressed at every turn and in the spring of 1963, they played a pivotal role in restoring humanity to themselves and to a race divided America. They were trained in the strategy of passive resistance and motivated by their imaginations of a new world that they never knew, a world where all children are free. When the jails filled up with their parents and the adults, the children marched. Armed with the power of resistance, they marched for their freedom, they marched for justice, and they marched for their lives. But their passive resistance was met with violence, just like the adults. Dogs were sicked on them, water hoses sprayed on their bodies. Thousands of students were arrested and as the world watched in sorrow on their televisions, those who were watching, including those in the White House. They inspired other children throughout the South to join in the crusade. They made 
a difference. What spurred thousands of children to action? The power of love. What gave them the power to rebel and resist? The power of love. How is it that children of all ages were the ones to garner the largest victory seen thus far in the civil rights movement? The power of love. For they realize that no child is free until all children are free. As Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, somehow we must be able to stand up before our most bitter opponents and say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we will still love you. When the children march. Each year we make a commitment, a pledge, to support the ministry of our church. In addition to this contribution, each Sunday we can make a collection so that we can share with those doing just justice beyond our church community. While we are unable to come together in person, you can still share your resources. To make your contribution, you can send a text and follow a prompt. We will have the number on the screen as the music plays for the offertory. For the month of July, we are sharing our plate with Treaty People Gathering. This morning, we offer you a short video clip of Winona LaDuke with an explanation of line three. What is line three? A lot of people wanna know and a lot of people don't know. So think of it this way. There are six really old pipelines that they put through in northern Minnesota, shipping diluted tar sands from Alberta to Superior, Wisconsin. And one of those lines is called Line 3. It has, according to Enbridge, about uh, 900 structural anomalies in it. Structural anomalies are things like small little pinhole leaks, maybe it comes some cracks, and some of those end up to be big problems, like that Kalamazoo spill. That was a structural anomaly. Line three, it's old and it's corroding and it's at the end of its life. It's already had a number of leaks and spills and frankly, it's a catastrophe waiting to happen. There is a likelihood that there is a whole bunch of contamination under the present line. And once that corrodes, our children and grandchildren may one day watch it drain a lake or a wetland or flood a farm field. Fixing these problems is very expensive. So Enbridge wants to abandon the pipeline walk away and build a brand new one in a brand new corridor. Enbridge calls this a replacement project. They're replacing line three. They are not replacing line three. They're putting in a whole new corridor and doubling the size of the line. That is not a replacement. That's a brand new line. And that's what's wrong. So we've got two problems. First, we've got a problem of the proposed new sandpiper and line three corridor through the heart of our best lakes and wild rice watersheds and through our treaty territories. We also have the problem of this old crumbling line that Enbridge wants to abandon. And right now what abandonment means is that they just leave it and walk away. And the company says that they will take care of it, but it is not clear that there is any liability from the Enbridge Corporation. The worst part is that neither the United States government or the state of Minnesota has any plan to deal with it. The good news is, is that the Ojibwe tribes are standing up and a lot of landowners, county commissioners and mayors are getting increasingly concerned about who's going to be liable for Enbridge's mess. So tell Governor Dayton to tell the state legislator to tell county commissioners that abandonment is not what we want. We want big Canadian energy corporations to clean up their mess and not leave it for all of us. And we feel that they should put hard working Minnesotans to work doing it. It's time to make a plan investing in cleaning up and stabilizing our existing infrastructure in building stuff that actually serves people. Miigwech, this is Winona Leduc. UUs across the country are supporting indigenous people and the others protesting line three, including contributing to a fund 
which will help pay the $3,000 fine that each protester has to pay so they don't go to jail for a year. So please give as you are able. Thank you. Now I invite you to, to join me in reading our offertory words. The words are printed in your order of service and are on your screen. This church is the community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm it and enable it to it and enable its particip its participation in the larger world around us. I invite you now into the spirit of prayer and meditation. Let us start by breathing together. Take a breath in and out. And we begin in thanks. Thankful for the breath in our lungs the beauty of our earth and the strength of this community. We hold in our hearts those who care for family in ill health, those who live with grief and chronic pain, those struggling with addiction or illness seen and unseen, we are with you. For parents and teachers and all those whose primary spiritual practice is caring for children, we are with you. We pray for neighbors in prison, our neighbors, our people. For those who are struggling to stay afloat in the midst of poverty, we are with you. We pray for those who are in harm's way right now. We pray for our planet and commit to work that will lead us away from the harms of climate change. We pray that wisdom, compassion, and empathy guide the leaders of our world. May they and we be the instruments of a just and lasting peace. Our lives are blessed by those who knowingly, with curiosity and courage, face their final days. For those locked in concentration camps at the border, held in cages in inhumane conditions, for those in ICE detention centers there in Chicago, and for those seeking refuge here in Vermont, we are with you. And we commit to doing more. For those struggling with fear and anxiety right now, we offer our prayers of comfort and care for those who face the loss of a job, financial resources, and security right now. We offer solidarity and a commitment to share what we can for those struggling with the impact of isolation. Even still, we promise to reach out with love. Into this shared silence, I invite you now to speak the name of anyone you wish to lift up into the loving support of this community. And with our deepest compassion, let us hold in our hearts those who we are naming right now those who are unnamed, those remembered, and those forgotten. Let it be so. Ashe. Amen.
and blessed be. Now I will light two candles, one representing the joys and celebrations we are experiencing and another representing the courage, the concerns and sorrows we are holding. these joys, celebrations, sorrows, and struggles close to our hearts. Our reading today is, It is That Time and Place by the Reverend Dr. Kiana Rahman. Now is the time to call on the memories of the ancestors who thought they could not walk another step toward freedom, and yet they did. It is that time and place to call on the memories of the ancestors who, when the darkness of their lives threatened to take away the hope and light, reached a little deeper and prayed yet another prayer. It is that time and place to remember those who came through the long night to witness another sunrise. It is that time and place to remember the oceans of tears shed to deliver us to this time, to remember the bent knees and bowed backs, to remember the fervent voices asking, begging, and beseech, beseeching for loved ones sold off. Time to remember their laughter and joy, though they had far less and little reason for optimism. Yet, they stayed on the path toward a better day. Time to hold, to the, to hold the steadfast hands, steadfast hands and hearts and prayers of the ancestors that have brought us this far. Time to make them proud and show them and ourselves what we are made of. Time to show them that their prayers and sacrifices and live, lives were not in vain and did not go unnoticed, nor have they been forgotten. Did you not know that this day would come? Did you not know that we would have to change places? 
Did you not know that just as our ancestors were delivered, that you will also be delivered? Have you not seen the greatness and power of the creative energy in the universe called God that moves and has its being through human agency? Have you not seen God in your neighbor's faces, in the homeless, in the battered woman, the trafficked child, the undocumented worker, the dispossessed? It is that time and place to know that it is our turn, that we must leave a leg legacy for our children and all the children. It is that time and that place. We are the ones we've been waiting for. For that, let us be eternally grateful. Amen and blessed be. And now we will hear our anthem.
You have just seen a scene from the movie Selma and heard underneath it Carl Kennedy and my version of the song, This May Be the Last Time. The melody of that song may be familiar to some of you, and we heard it at the very beginning of this service, Wade in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. But during the later years of the civil rights movement, activists began to realize that the water had already been troubled. Harriet Tubman troubled the waters by rescuing hundreds of her enslaved people into freedom like Moses and the children of Israel. Frederick Douglass had troubled the waters by saying, what is the 4th of July to the Negro? The waters had been troubled by Ida B. Wells and her anti-lynching crusade. It had been troubled by Walter White, who passed as white, infiltrating and spying on the Ku Klux Klan. It had been troubled by Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat. It was no longer about God's gonna trouble the waters, but the waters were already troubled and rocking the boat of white supremacy and racism through boycotts, through protests, through massive voter registrations, through sit-ins, through marches, and we saw the black, the black lash against them by segregationist and racist. I remember learning about the freedom singers leading those gathered in black churches, mostly in Alabama and Georgia, with rousing songs to uplift their spirits and get them ready for what they were about to face. Peaceful, nonviolent resistance and protest met with fury, violence, and incarcerations. I have watched documentaries, not, cre not recreations like the film Selma, but cameras that recorded in real time the water hoses, the canine units, the billy club, some of you were there, and the many, many arrests. Then the deaths. Deaths first outside of the protests, like the lynching of Emmett Till in Mississippi, but then the brutality and the abandonment of civility upon the peaceful. And the bloodshed like on bloody summer, sun Sunday in Selma, Alabama. The songs went from Wade in a Water to Keep Your Eyes on the Prize to This May Be the Last Time. It reminds me of the resilience and sacrifice of the early Christians in the Roman Empire persecuted for their conversion to a new faith. I remember reading in a class on global Christianity at Meadville Lombard examples of these early Christians taking a stand and becoming martyrs. Those who became martyrs could have easily saved their, themselves by denying who they were and who they served, but decided that it was better to die in faith and in truth than to live in denial and a lie. They were followers of Jesus Christ and followed his example of faith and commitment until death, for they believed that the ultimate sacrifice would yield the ultimate reward, and for them, it was everlasting life. Even before the Roman authority arrived, the accused were indiscriminately attacked by the public in forms, and I quote, of clamors, blows, draggings, robberies, stonings, and imprisonments, and all the things which an infuriated mob delighted in inflicting upon enemies and adversaries. It is clear that this was done not by accident, but intentionally before they even had a chance to answer to their perversion. And yet most of them stood their ground and gave up their lives. The early Christian martyrs sacrificed their lives and those who marched and protest in the civil rights movement like Martin Luther King and those assembled on the Edmund Pettus Bridge staring into the gauntlet made me reflect and think for what cause 
would I be willing to risk my life for? For what cause would I give up my security, my comfort, my safety for? For what are we called to martyrdom now, in this time, and in this place? A couple of months ago, 20-year-old Dante Wright was killed after being pulled over for having an air freshener dangling from his rearview mirror in Minneapolis, just 10 miles from where George Floyd was murdered last year. Upon the news of this accident, I reflected on how four and a half years ago, I too was pulled over for having an air freshener dangling from my rear view mirror in rear view, rural Virginia after hosting an election gathering at the James Madison University that saw Donald Trump elected as president. I asked myself in that moment, as I saw the glaring lights in back of me and the next morning when I saw Donald Trump being president, may this be my last time. I lived. Dante died. Right after Dante's death, I looked at the air freshener still dangling from my rear view mirror and immediately wanted to get rid of it for fear that it could happen to me. It haunts me every time I see it, but I am resolved to keep it. I am resolved to meet the risk head on for what is life. If I live in constant fear, it is such a burden, y'all. What life would I live after bowing down to fear and oppression to save my own life? If I am to die, I want to die living free. If I am to die, I want to die living holy with a W. If I die, I want to die fighting for justice. I want to die marching for peace. I want to die dismantling racism in all forms of oppression with every ounce of my being. I'm resolved to march for justice like the ones at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but will I turn around? Martin Luther King's decision that day brought about many criticisms, but he felt that their sacrifice that day wouldn't make a difference. So he went wisely in a different direction. Unfortunately, he died a few years later on a balcony of a motel, but after the Voting Rights Act was successfully passed. In his spirit, I say right now, sick lions on me, sick dogs on me, make me bleed red blood fighting against darkened hearts. Let me be the light as Jesus is to many who followed him. Let me be a black man in America. Let me be a light in this dark world with all of my blackness, with all of my being, with all of my blood, and with all of my might. But that's me. That's for me. That's my calling, my struggle, my plight, my life. But know that my life is connected to yours. So, for what cause would you be willing to risk your life for? What cause would you give up your security, your comfort, your safety for? For what are we called to martyrdom now in this time and in this place? I'll give you a moment. Moments up. Racism is detrimental to and counteracts the building of a beloved community and a beloved world. If we can't 
If we can only dismantle racism and other forms of oppression within ourselves and our institutions, then we can build the beloved community and create the world that we want instead of the one that we have. Can you see a world in which all people can share in the abundance of earth and protect it for love's sake? Can you see a world where poverty, hunger, and homelessness is not tolerated because we won't allow it? Can you see a world where all people, their uniqueness, their colors, their nationalities, their sexualities, their origins, their religious practices, their spiritualities are not eradicated, but affirmed? in love, a world that has no place for racism, no place for discrimination, no place for bigotry, and no place for prejudice, a world built by the all-inclusive spirit of love and humanity. We have the dreams of all those martyrs in the palms of our hands to build a beloved community, not just within our congregations, but to spread it outwards to the world. On April 3rd, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King gave his last sermon saying, we've got some difficult days ahead but it really doesn't matter to me now because I have been to the mountaintop. I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. I am happy tonight. I am not worried about anything. I am not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Well, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming peace, the glory of the coming equality. We must believe that a beloved community is possible and become the hands and the feet to see to it. We must believe that joy will come in the morning after we have endured this long night of weeping. And when that sun rises, that glorious sun of justice, when the sun rises in that morning, it will rise with healing in its wings. Now I'm not saying that we are called to die, but this work, that we must do, something must die. If not ourselves, then our privilege that is tied to whiteness, that must die. If not ourselves, then our supremacy that is tied to whiteness, that must die. If not ourselves, then our constant need and desire to accumulate more wealth and more stuff at the expense of others less fortunate, less educated, less lucky, that must die. But how do we sacrifice what we thought made America great when so many efforts are trying right now to make it great again, when in fact, it was never great to begin with? How do we do this? You know what? I cannot wait to truly unlock the creative energy of human agency to make that happen, to make the killing stop, to make racism stop, to make oppression stop, to make hatred stop. It is that time, it is that place to awaken the power of love within us that is way more powerful than hate. That love, that power of love that is way more powerful than oppression, more powerful than suppression, more powerful than supremacy itself. As we move, as we move to build this beloved world, as we build a new way, may we all know that we are precious. 
We are all beautiful and we are all loved. I cannot wait to lay down my burdens by the riverside and study war no more. I cannot wait to put down my sword and my shield and study war no more. But until then, pick up your sword, pick up your shield, and let the power and the spirit of love unite us and help us to build a new beloved world. And let us all live to see that day in body or in spirit. Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. Maybe so. Ashe. And blessed be. Hmm. Now please join us now in singing our closing hymn. Sing with joy, sing with passion, down by the riverside. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I'm Gonna lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside I'm Gonna study study war no more I ain't gonna study war no more gonna study war no more I ain't gonna study war no more I ain't gonna study war no more I ain't gonna study war no more I'm gonna lay down Down by the riverside, that's right, down by the riverside, I'm gonna lay down my burden, oh yeah, down by the riverside, I'm gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna Excuse me. <laughs> it's still Sunday, right? Wow. Thank you so much. It's been indeed an honor to be with you again. And thank you so much for this opportunity and in our shared ministry. I invite you now to cross your hands over your heart and to hear the words of benediction from one of my mentors, the Reverend William G. Sinkford. Spirit of life and love, dear God of all nations, there is so much work to do. We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Help us hold fast to our vision of what can be. May we see the hope in our history and find the courage and the voice to work for that constant rebirth of freedom and justice. That 
is our dream. May it be so. Amen. And Asher. Go in peace.